Okay, thanks. Okay, so again, uh, welcome to quantum computation, PH870. The topics we'll be covering are roughly along these lines, uh, right? So obviously I'll throw in a little bit of classical ideas of computation just to familiarize you with the basic idea of what computation is supposed to be. We will discuss the notion of complexity, computational complexity, which is a measure of how difficult it is to write a program which can solve a given problem. So this, this uh, field started developed uh, with uh, work done by Alan Turing and Kurt Godel uh, in the uh, early part of the 20th century. And it has some of the most fascinating and counterintuitive results that you know exist um, in any field of uh, mathematics, physics, or computer science, right? So then this leads to the notion of Turing machines, which is the most general kind of uh, analog uh, or classical computer, and we eventually run into the problem that it turns out that most complex problems are not soluble using classical computers, right? Another way to state this is that we have systems which are quantum mechanical in nature, right? And the question is, can a classical system can a classical computer simulate a quantum computer, a quantum system, right? So let's say I want to talk about the, interac uh, the interaction of a photon with a helium atom, right? So even such a simple system requires tremendous classical resources in terms of CPU power. And as you keep adding degrees of freedom to your system, the amount of comp classical computational power needed scales exponentially in that in the number of degrees of freedom. Right? So you moment you go beyond like let's say 10 or 12 qubits or particles, your system becomes effectively unsolvable using any classical machines. So people, you have to use all kinds of approximations and other analytical tools and so on. So what this says is that quantum systems cannot be simulated with classical machines. What, can, what is required to simulate a quantum system then? Another quantum system, right? So if you want to simulate the interaction of some quantum mechanical system, which has some n degrees of freedom, you would need another quantum mechanical system, which would have more than n degrees of freedom, because some of them will be required for processes like you know, memory registers, keeping track of operations uh, and uh, error correction, because in any, 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 any computation there, is, there are errors. But you could, you could simulate an N body quantum system with another quantum system, which is uh, not exponential in N. Right, so the size scales as some polynomial of n, like n square, let's say, or n log n, or something like that. Right, then, so we'll talk about the relationship between physical models and computation, or between physics and and computation. In fact, now the development of physics has taken the following uh, general route. It started out with just physics, right? Galileo, Galileo's observations, and then um, Tycho Brahe before that. And then Newton came along and he invented the calculus, right? 
talk about a summer project, right? He invented the calculus for the purpose of understanding these, these orbits. So from that point in time, mathematics became an integral part of physics, right? So this was the way it continued till the 20th century, right? Physics started to become more and more mathematical. You can hear me at the back, right? So with the introduction, especially of Einstein's general theory of relativity, Riemannian differential geometry, which you might, many of you might have heard of, right? Which is considered to be one of the more difficult mathematical topics was introduced into physics. And then the development of quantum field theory led to the introduction of even more complicated mathematics, Feynman diagrams, and, you know, just ridiculous amounts of uh, math. And then the development of string theory really caused everything to go nuts, right? mathematically speaking. So, but now what we are realizing, we have been in the process of realizing over the past 30, 40, 50 years, is that it's not, the physical world should not just be viewed as some physical models, you know, some clockwork machine or some waves or anything, something like that, to which you apply some mathematical model and you can simulate the behavior of this system. Instead, you can view the physical phenomenon it, itself as a form of computation. And this applies not just to physical phenomena in the sense of inorganic phenomena, like you know, atoms interacting with in, in a gas or a solid or you know, a semiconductor. This paradigm of viewing systems as computational objects, right, is very, gen very general. And it allows us to extend our, this, this model modeling idea, the idea that you can model a system from the realm of physical systems to the realm of organic systems and complex systems. So you can, you can start to think of an organism, for instance, as a computational uh, object, right? And so you can describe like a bacteria, let's say, in terms of how much information it can gather from its surroundings, how much it can process. And while it does that, how much uh, there are certain amounts of heat that is generated, all of that is uh, specified in something known as Landau's principle. So we'll talk about that also. So in a very real sense, it, it has become more and more clear that physics is computation. So physical models can be thought of as, you know, whenever you, whenever you are looking at some billiard balls, right, they're bouncing on a table. Now, you would think that, well, how do I describe this system? You would say, okay, I'll use Newton's laws. I'll put that into Newton's second law of motion, right? I'll plug in the momenta and the positions of the balls and I'll put it in some, uh, this thing, computer and it can calculate the trajectories for me and so on. But at the end of the day, the point is that this is not just a bunch of balls which are hitting each other and the table. You can view what is happening on this, on this billiard table as a computation. So what is the input data? What is the output data? The input data is the initial state of the system. Whatever the initial momenta, the configuration of the system is, the initial momenta and the positions. What is the output data? The output data is the final state of the system, right? You can choose 
whatever the final state is, it, it is when you make the measurement after how, however many time steps. What, what is the computation? It is the in process of interaction between all the different elements of the system. Right? So you can consider uh, the case of, let's say, two balls colliding and then scattering. Right? You can, you can think of it as a computational process. Right? You can think of one of these balls as, let's say, your logic, logical uh, bit. And the other one you can think of as a control bit, right? So depending on the momentum of this ball, this logical ball changes its state to something else. Okay. Anyway, these these ideas will become more clear as we discuss further. Then we come to the what what are the fundamental constituents of quantum computers, and those are qubits or quantum bits. And very simply speaking, those are two state systems. These are the simplest quantum mechanical systems. Then we'll talk about uh, unitary gates, operators, no cloning, all of this. And this is probably not going to make much sense to you un un until I come to these topics. Okay. So let's, let's uh, and, and, and then an essential part of this course is going to be an introduction to uh, two different software toolkits. Now, how many of you uh, know how to program in Python? Okay, so that's like almost everybody except Shweta. And anybody else who, who doesn't know? Uh, you are? Aman. Dube? Kasha. Okay, so you guys can learn. Programming in Python is embarrassingly easy, right? Okay, so uh, these are two software toolkits. The first one is meant for simulating quantum systems. You can, you can uh, describe what a state is, what the Hamiltonian is, what the operators are, and solve the system. QIS kit is the interface to IBM's quantum computers. So quantum computers are real, okay? They exist, they're in operation right now. And so IBM, so all of these different, com they're different companies, Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, Rigetti Computing, they all have their different machines, right? So. Quantum computation right now is in the same state that let's say that classical computation was um, about 80 years ago when everybody had to build their own specialized machine which occupied full entire buildings, right? So only the people who built that machine knew how to work with it, right? Because it was built with, with all these vacuum tubes and all kinds of technology, which was very specific so it's, it's a bit like that. So QIS kit is the interface to IBM's computers, but you can also use it as a general purpose uh, pro quantum programming language, okay? So we will see in the process of uh, going through these lectures. So, so let me, show you what my skate is oh, usual and say learn content. So QIS kit is very nice because for one thing, they have a very comprehensive uh, textbook available, right? 
which introduces you to all the very basic concepts, starting from the simplest. All right. So for instance, here is a nice uh, question. Which of the following is the correct description of a bit? A blade used by a carpenter? Something you put in a horse's mouth? Or the smallest unit of information? Which one is it? It can be all three actually. Because you can say that whether the bit is in the horse's mouth corresponds to zero and not being in the horse's mouth corresponds to one. But of course, it's much more tricky to do computation with, with horses than it is with, with other forms of, uh, of, of physical systems, right? So this is a representation of, a, of the quantum, the state space of a qubit. Okay, so we'll learn what, what this represents. This is something called a block sphere, B-L-O-C-H. And the, so this is a sphere, the points on the sphere represent all the possible states that a single qubit can take. So again, we'll, we'll talk more about what a, what a qubit is, what are, what are states and so on and so forth. And then QIS kit, it comes with, uh, It comes with all, the, it shows you all the code, uh, which in, in the form of Python and Jupyter notebooks. How many of you have used Jupyter uh, before? How can you use Jupyter and not use Python? Okay. Okay, so, so this will be an integral part, okay? Because as I cover different kinds of algorithms and gates and so on and so forth, right? I will, uh, in parallel to the discussion in the class, I will be showing you how to implement that in QIS kit, right? And then the goal is that all of you should find some problem uh, and you know that will be like your, your semester project. Because it doesn't make any sense to take a class in, on quantum computation and not know how to use a quantum computer, right? It's like taking a class on swimming without ever going into water, right? It's not much use if you just know what a breaststroke is theoretically, right? It's not going to help you. All right, so with that being said, I will get started talking about um, quantum mechanics. So let me start with that. Any questions at this point? <laughs> yeah. Um, and you are, just remind me again. Vineet. Uh, so Vineet, uh, I don't know. This is the first time I've taught the course. Is it right? This is the first time this course has been taught in the physics department. I believe that there are similar courses which have been taught in, I think, ECE or other departments. But uh, so you are all my test subjects, all right? And uh, hopefully the outcome of this computation will be positive, okay? But the thing is that I need constant feedback from you all, right? You all need to keep me in check. If I wander off too much into the physics, you need to bring me back. If I go too much into exploring some algorithm in detail, again, you need to bring me back, right? Because the goal of the algorithms the, is we want to understand the physics behind the algorithms. Okay, all right. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, name? Prasad. Ah, Prasad. Yes, yes, absolutely. I'll be putting them on YouTube. 
that's one reason why I'm using the Zoom setup. Uh, because it makes absolutely no sense for me to sit here and use my time and energy and effort and not record it, right? But I can't promise you the exact schedule, okay? Of when I will upload the videos. I'll try to do it as soon as possible, but sometimes there might be delays. Any other questions? Okay. So let's let's get started. Okay, what is so the first question is what is computation? Now let me just check one thing. Um, I I hope that uh, yeah I'll just have to. Assume that that's the case. Okay. So, quantum comp so before we understand quantum computation, right? We should understand what computation is, right? Now, so let's look at what is classical computation. If my writing, if my letters are too small, please let me know. I'll try to make them a little bigger. Is this is this okay, Prasad? Is this visible? So what is classical computation, right? Computation is the statement that you have a box, right? You send in some data, the box does something, right? And you get some data. So, but to be more precise about it, we want to find a representation of this data, right? Which we can implement in some mechanical system, right? So how do we represent data, right? We represent it in terms of bits. So zero and one. And how do we represent functions? We represent functions as operations which act on these bits, right? So operations are, we'll call them gates, right? There are all kinds of gates, NAND, AND, OR, XOR, right? Associated with each gate, associated with each gate uh, is what is called a truth table. Okay? Now, I suppose <laughs> it's, it's not, uh, Visible, is it? Once again, let me see. Okay, so for the sake of those who might be following the lecture, what I've just been talking about is truth tables, um, Boolean logic gates, and not XOR search operations and the fact that the most um, the most inefficient way to to find something requires at least n operations. Right? Now, depending on the structure of your data, this can the, the number of operations can be reduced. For instance, if your data can be given some sort of ordering, right? Meaning that there is, there is a way in which you can put the data in sequence. So for instance, it could be a set of images 
which are all labeled by uh, by time right so that would allow you to put the sequence the images in a sequence right ordered according to time then assuming your candidate also has a time label you don't have to search all your images all you need to do is you need to look at a certain interval of time right so structured data will be more easier to to search obviously than unstructured data right now let me just uh, in the also show you to break the discussion a little bit the two primary uh, textbooks that i will be using um for this course sen and those are uh, this textbook by nilsen and chuang it is the quantum computation bible it is very very comprehensive 710 pages obviously we won't going through we won't be going through all 710 pages uh right uh, and then the second set of uh, notes is the set of lecture notes by john preskill john preskill uh, is another very famous physicist the california institute of technology caltech so in the in these lecture notes uh, there are 1 2 3 4 5 6 six chapters but in fact uh so the, even though the table of contents only shows six chapters there are more than that uh there are uh, eight chapters there is a seventh chapter which is on quantum error correction and then there is a ninth chapter chapter 9 on topological quantum computation okay so this is a particular model of quantum computation uh, which we will look at near the probably near the end of the course if we have the time so so these two are uh the primary ref references okay and they are both available on moodle all right so now let me continue with this discussion of computation so one of the questions is that is there any limit to what what is what is calculable right and there are two aspects to it one is a theoretical aspect which asks the question right given that you have access to unlimited com computational resources right what are the problems that can be solved and are there any problems which cannot be solved regardless of the uh resources that you are available to you right so the other is the physical aspect this ask the question what happens in the during the physical process of a computation itself right so you all know for instance that any computer comes with a fan right why is there a fan because the cpu generates heat right why is it generating heat because computation involves work right so work leads to the generation of heat 
So if you have a chip, let's say, right? And it has N, um, let's say N transistors, right? So a transistor is a, this thing, an element of a classical circuit, right? You can represent it in this way. Um, there's a input and output and a control, something like this. Well, probably not the right symbol. So the more the number of transistors that you can put on your chip, right, the more operations that chip can perform. But the problem is that every transistor in the process of every single computational step will generate a certain amount of heat. Let's call that Delta Q, right? So if you have N transistors per unit area, right? And if you want to make your chips more and more powerful, what you want to do is you want to keep increasing N, the density of, uh, this computational elements. But then the heat generated by, by in each given unit area also increases, right? So it becomes, let's say, N times delta Q, calories or joules, whatever you prefer, per unit area, per computational time step, right? Assuming that in a single computational time step, all the elements are, are, are active. Of course, this is the upper bound. This is not the general case, right? So as the number of elements increases, the amount of heat that is generated, right? Becomes larger and larger per unit area. So you need to build more and more powerful cooling systems, right? So if you look at, can you please put on a mask if you have one? Thanks. Everybody else I've asked to do that, so. Um, so the, you know, I mean, I don't know how many of you have seen like a gaming machine. Any of you have seen a CPU with a water cooled, set up, right? The, so the GPUs become very hot, right? GPU stands for graphic processing unit. And so people have all kinds of different apparatuses, like, you know, apart from just fans, they have liquid cooling, right? And m many other such, uh, you know, such tricks. But the point is that eventually you will reach a stage where no matter how much heat you dissipate, right? You, you, you can never dissipate enough heat. You will reach a point with when the number of transistors per unit area is so large that the heat generated in any given portion of your chip cannot be dissipated in the, in the same amount of time. So what happens? Your computer shuts down, right? So this is a physical limit on, on computational capacity, right? Oops. And where does it come from? It comes from something known as Landauer's principle. So the Landauer's principle is one of the most important statements of, uh, of the physics of information, right? And what is the statement of Landauer's uh, principle? It says the following, that, Erasure of information 
is necessarily a dissipative process. What does what do these words mean, and why are they important? So first of all, why do we need to erase information? Right? Well, you have, this is your chip. Your chip can only take a certain amount of data, right? In any given unit of time, right? So let's say the, the input capacity of the chip is I not. Oh, sorry, my mistake. Thanks. Right? Then this data goes into the chip and there are various registers which are used in the process of intermediate steps of the computational process where the data is stored. And then the, com you know, the computation is performed and you get the result. Now, when you want to process the next batch of data, right? What is required? These registers, they contain the data from the previous step. They will have to be erased, right? because you can only have a finite number of, re of registers, right? It's like when you use a calculator, right? If you use a calculator, which doesn't have a memory, every time you, you punch in some keys or you perform a calculation, the last, the previous uh, data is released, is, is it erased, right? So what's the, what's the way around that? Well, the way around it is the calculated developers came up with this memory function. And so you could press this M button and your output would be saved. And then you could recall it and use it in the next computation. And then digital calculators came along, which have a scrolling display screen, right? But again, the amount of memory is finite, right? The amount of information that I can display on this screen is finite. So if I want to show you the next screen, if I want to show you this screen, what is required? What was there previously has to be erased. It has been erased, right? That is what this computer and that projector are doing. Well, the projector is just showing what the computer is doing. The computer is doing the erasure, right? So as I do this, something is erased and something else is written. Something is erased, something else is written, right? So what Landauer said is that erasure is necessarily a dissipative process. And what do we mean by a dissipative process? What is dissipation? Dissipation means something which involves loss of energy, right? So some process which involves friction, right? So if you think in terms of motion, if you, if you have a block that is sliding, if there is some friction, that is a dissipated process. And almost all processes that we know of in nature are dissipated, right? If that was not the case, uh, in fact, uh, we would you know, actually run into all kinds of paradoxes. So dissipation is a good thing, okay? Because dissipation imposes limits on any physical system, right? So there is a very nice uh, analogy that I, that I think of to illustrate this what the what what this you know the limits it imposes on on various systems you you have seen the hulk right everybody knows what the hulk who the hulk is the incredible hulk now there apart from the fact that the incredible hulk there are two things that are incredible one is the fact that his clothes always expand proportional proportionally you know, 
that is one thing but the other incredible part is that in a very short amount of time this human being suddenly develops a lot of huge amount of muscle mass right this is the transformation that happens but the thing is that such a transformation right if you think about it in terms of energy what would it require it would require tremendous amounts of energy from some place, right so where would that energy be be taken from presumably it would be taken from the environment right so every time bruce banner transforms into the hulk everything in 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 his surroundings should freeze over right that doesn't happen simultaneously his uh, muscle tissue it grows that process of growth will generate heat if you have very rapid growth the amount of heat generated is you know so that's called a non adiabatic process the amount of heat generated is much larger than in an adiabatic process so at the same time as the environment around him would become very cold the body of the in hulk would be glowing hot right from all the heat that is generated and so obviously such things are not taken into account right in the in the representation that you see in the comic books if they were none of the superheroes would be possible right so because we have we have dissipation right something like the incredible hulk is not possible in 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 nature right you can have a transformation of some muscle tissue but the more rapid you want the transformation to be the more heat will be generated right and the more energy it will require so this is an example of the dissipation as preskill says he can store one bit of information by placing a single molecule in a box right okay. so let me show that to you this is a box right and i divide it up in two sides and i put a single molecule and i refer to this state when the molecule is in the left side of the box as zero and when the molecule is on the right side of the of the box i refer to it as being in the one state okay now erasure means that we move the molecule to the left side irrespective of whether it starts out on the left or right so what is erasure erasure means resetting your system back to some default state so for instance if i take this this page on which i'm writing and i erase it well before erasing it i should duplicate it now if i take this page and i erase it it goes back to some default setting this is my default setting my blank page right so in this case my default setting is when my molecule is on the left side of my box now how can i how can i do this i can suddenly remove the partition right this is a partition that well you can't see both of those things at the same time i guess and let me make this a little bit a second okay and 
slowly compress the one molecule gas with a piston until the molecule is definitely on the left side. So what that what does that mean? I have this partition, right? I remove the partition. And then here I have a piston. And then I apply some pressure, some force and move that piston. When I move that piston, what happens? It will push the particle until I know for sure that the particle is indeed in the left side of the box, right? If you don't know this, right? So this is this is this is where the process of dissipation comes in. It is in the process of the reduction of your uncertainty about some the state of some system, right? Now what happens is that when you reduce when you, when you reduce the volume of this box, you change the entropy of, the, of this system. Okay, and I'll talk about entropy in a second. Now, my question before I continue is, can all of you, do you all have to go somewhere right now? Do you have another 10 minutes or so? So that I can finish this Landau's principle and entropy and all that. Is that okay with everybody? Because today, like the earlier part of the class, I just spent on like talking. So there is a change in the entropy. And when there is a change in entropy, then thermodynamics tells us that work is done. And that is where the energy consumption comes into the picture. So what is this, what is this entropy? Okay, and entropy is a very, very central concept in, in physics, in, in computation. So what is, what is entropy? Do, how many of you have encountered this concept before? How many of you uh, can say that you understand what entropy is? or feel confident about explaining the concept to somebody else? Zero, right? Entropy is one of the more abstract concepts and unfortunately it is neglected in, especially in our BTEC courses. I wanted to introduce it into the BTEC curriculum, but I can only do so much. So entropy is, a measure of, well, there are different ways in which it is described. It, it's a measure of the disorder of a system. It's a measure of the amount of information in a system. Now, sometimes if, if you say this to some, somebody some who's, who's computer science major, uh, they will laugh at you as they laughed at me when I said this on some, message board back in the 1990s. And then uh, they told me to play, press Alt F4 and I didn't know what that would do. I pressed Alt F4. But, but even then I was right and they were wrong. That entropy is indeed a measure of information. So how, what, what, what does that mean, right? So imagine that you have a, a classroom as you do now, right? And in the classroom, there are N, N seats or N chambers. And there are K students. Where K is, has to be less than or equal to N, right? Obviously. Or instead of a classroom, let's think of a uh, think of a bus. This is actually a better analogy. So these students, or shall I say, passengers, as they enter the bus, one by one, one passenger goes here. 
right? Another passenger goes here. Another passenger goes here, the next one. So let's say there are four passengers. Now, if these people don't know each other, right? Unless they are best buds. What do you think is the most likely scenario for the seating? Is it, is it going to be the case that all four of them will end up sitting next to each other? Is that generally what you observe? No, right? What, you, what do you observe? Unless it's, it's winter and it's cold and people want to stick together, the, what you observe is that people want to spread out, right? They want to occupy as much territory as each individual can, right? So these are two different states of the same system. This is one state. And this is another state. And what is the difference between these two states? How would I characterize once the first state and the second state, right? You would say that the first state is more ordered than the second state. That's one way to describe it. Another way to describe it is that you would say that if this is the first state and the second state, you would say that the entropy of the first state is greater than the entropy of the second state. So you would say that the amount of disorder is greater in the first state than in the second state, right? There is a informational way in which you can characterize this, in which in, you can make this statement more precise. If all the people are lined up like this, right? And I want an algorithm to tell me what the seating chart is. I can, I can write down the following, right? I can say that my algorithm is the following, that this, this seat over here, this corner is occupied. And then the next seat is occupied and the next seat is occupied, next seat is occupied. Right? So my algorithm just goes to the next seat and fills. So I can write a very short piece of code, right? Which only takes the coordinates of this box and the number of people to generate this state, right? I take the coordinates of this box and I take the number of people and then I just go to the next coordinate and I put in the next person and I continue this until all the people are exhausted. So I have compressed the information, right? Into a algorithm. In this case, can you find such an algorithm? It's not clear that, right? In this case, it appears that if you want to specify the state of the system, you, seem, you have to specify the individual coordinates, all four coordinates, right? So the first one, the, the, sorry, the second state can be compressed to a single data point plus an algorithm. Whereas the first one requires the complete specification of all the data points, right? So computationally, which one has greater order? Computationally, which one is more compressed, which is more compressible? The second one is more compressible. The first one is less compressed. This can also be illustrated in terms of something that all of you use 
in your daily lives, which is data compression. Right? Life would not be the same without data compression. So for instance, if you take an image in the raw format, right? What is the raw format? It tells you for each of the pixels. So let's say you have 1024 by 768 pixels. It tells you for each one of these pixels, what is the RGB, what are the RGB values, right? Red, green, blue, or it can also be uh, the, uh, the different ways of specifying the color, right? But we'll just go with RGB. So how many data points are required to specify the image in the raw format? 1024 times 768 times three, right? So if I work out, work that out, you know, it, comes out to some, let's say X megabytes, right? But then I have all these other formats, right? One of them is called JPEG. What can JPEG do? JPEG can take a picture in, which is X megabytes. And this will be something like BMP format, the raw format, one of them, BMP stands for bitmap. It can take something that is in BMP format and compress it down to something that is YMB where Y is less than X, right? How does it do that? How does such a compression algorithm work? It looks for redundancies in the image, right? So for instance, if I have an image, which is pure noise, okay? And I have another image, which is less noisy, okay? Could be, could be anything. But both of them have the same size in the raw format, right? The amount of data that is present in the, both the images is the same. But if I compress these images using any of these algorithms, this will compress to Y1 and this will compress to Y2, right? Will Y1 in general be the same as Y2? Which one would you expect to be more? How many people uh, expect Y1 to be greater than Y2, the compressed size to be greater than of Y1 to be greater than Y2? If you're going to raise your hands, raise them like this. This means I don't really know. And how many expect Y2 to be greater than Y1? Right. So can, uh, can you tell me why? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. No, that's the exact opposite of the situation. Y two will be well less than Y. It is much easier to compress this image than it is into than it is to compress this image. Why? Because the second image, there are lots of correlations, right? There are lots of patterns. Just like in this state, there is a pattern. But in this case, where this is, let's say pure noise, right? There is no pattern. Correlations are very less. So this Y1 will be greater than Y2. Okay. Now imagine that you have an algorithm, which is the most efficient compression algorithm 
possible right and you give it some input stream of data okay doesn't matter what that input stream is and just think of some arbitrary string of ones and zeros the entropy of that string of one and zeros right corresponds to the size that is obtained by compressing that input data so i give you this this is my input data i compress it or i have something else i compress this which one will be smaller the first one will be smaller right so the, i would say this has less entropy than the second state so i hope that this gives you an intuitive understanding of what is entropy right so entropy is the measure of how much information is required to describe a system okay so a more complex system requires more information it has higher entropy coming back to landauer's principle when we know that the particle is in the left hand side of the box the system this has reduced the entropy by some amount and the amount it reduces the entropy by is the smallest possible change in entropy delta s is k log 2 now according to thermodynamics a change in entropy is accompanied by a transfer of heat right so which is given by q is equal to tds right so this process of erasure corresponds necessarily to a change in the entropy of the system right another way to understand is if i take this page and i erase it what will i end up with a blank page if i take this page and erase it i'll end up with the same blank page right so no matter how complicated my initial state is my final state is very simple right i am so my entropy is being reduced right this reduction of entropy is accompanied by the production of heat so landauer's principle says that information is physical whenever there is a erasure that generates heat what is the implication of landauer's principle the implication is that if you want to have reversible computation right what is reversible computation something that i can run backwards right i can take my output data and obtain the input by right by changing the polarity now but the problem is that if your information if your computation involves erasure at any point then you cannot reverse it right this is also in line with our understanding of what we mean by dissipation right so if you move an object along a surface which has friction this is not a reversible process this is an irreversible process right why is it an irreversible process because when i went from point a to point b i generated heat now i cannot go from point b to point a and absorb that heat back into the system that would be the reverse but that's not going to happen when i go from point b to point b point a again i will generate so 
reversibility is associated with lack of dissipation and correspondingly dissipation is associated with irreversibility right so if you want to have reversible computation what you need to do is you need to preserve all of the information at each step of the computation you cannot throw away any of the rough work right there's a lot of rough work that goes into any computation right registered uh, registers are being filled and they are being emptied and so on but you cannot throw any of that information away the moment you throw away the information the entropy of your system changes and your computation becomes irreversible right but if you have a very large computation to make it reversible you need enormous amounts of storage capacity right that's simply not feasible right so classical computation is necessarily our classical computational machines are necessarily irreversible right so i'll stop here the point of all of this was to convey to you the idea that information is physical it is not some abstract idea right physics places limits on how much information can be encoded into any system how efficiently that information can be uh trans transmitted between one system and another system right how fast it can be transmitted uh with with how much error can it be transmitted and so that directly feeds into our construction of computational devices tomorrow we'll talk more about uh this something called maxwell's demon which is related to nar landau's principle and then i'll talk about so these are the physical aspects right so i was saying there are some physical limitation right these are the physical aspects then after that we'll come to the theoretical aspects which involve the work of gödel and turing that there are some problems which even in principle are not solved okay so i think i've taken enough of your time today and it's the evening class so all of us are tired so i'll stop here and take your questions if you have any as when as many questions as you like uh, so like the uh, the kind of example you use for the um your name again name vinith, vinith. Vini, yeah. Narayan, Vini, go ahead, Vini. So, so the thing we use is that making zero by reducing the entropy. Yes. Yes. So now, for adding a particular information, say a uh, exact number or so, so we'll have to make sure that certain number of molecules go to the other side, right? Say, say I want to uh, now I made it zero 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 zero. Now I want to add say one zero one or something like that. So I need particular set of molecules to go to the right. No, no, no. no. that's see this is so this what this system represents this represents a single bit okay if your molecule is on the left side of the partition that corresponds to your bit being in the zero state if it's on the right side it corresponds to being in the one state if you want to erase it what do you do you apply this piston which compresses the box until you know that the molecule is on the left side you have to make it one then have to Side, well if you make it one you have to first you have to push it out and then you have to have some other mechanism of uh ensuring that it is in the right side so you would have another piston i think coming in from the left which would also be compressed which would also right which would reduce that what's the question So again, like, so we're making it one. Uh, so to push it towards the right, we're again reducing the entropy and reducing it. So can I say that even adding information is dissipative, not only the erasure of 
Yes. No, but 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 again, like, but what you can say for sure, right? In 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 clear terms, and I'm and I'm terms, is that erasure is accompanied with a reduction in the entropy of the system. That you can make an unambiguous statement about as to how much entropy changes. Now. The other, the, the, the opposite of that, which is to, you know, to write information in the system, that will also cause changes in the entropy, right? But that will, you know, depend on how much information you write, how you write that information and so on and so forth. But erasure, you can say unambiguously that it always comes with a certain minimum entropy cost which is this K log two. You can never get around this. You understand? So in one direction, the process is completely quantifiable. In the other direction, it's open-ended. Okay. And whether or not, you know, what is the precise amount of heat generated with writing and erasing? I will admit that I don't have all the answers. But this is where you can, this is where I, this is the source of new ideas, right? So feel free to think about this question more and increase the entropy of your brain in the process. Next. Yeah, uh -huh. I understand how this is related to the initial example that we use the chip and we went on say increasing the computation. So, so that it cannot be so this chip, like I said, it has registers. Huh? First of all, in any computer in any single time step, it can only take a finite chunk of data. Right? That finite chunk of data is being processed. So you have to carry over some numbers or you have to like have some, you know, uh, intermediate information that is generated in the process, right? That has to be saved in some temporary memory registers, right? So this is for another example. One second, <laughs> right? Now, the number of registers that you can have is finite. So depending on the complexity of the computation, you might be able to use the given set of registers you have in one pass and get your output, but it's possible that the chip might have to take the data again, reprocess it. That would require you to erase the memory registers, no? that the, this temporary memory, right? your RAM would require erasing. So if your pro computation is a bit more complicated, you have to go around again and again and again, you have to keep erasing. Every time you erase, you generate heat. Okay, let me get a question from somebody else. Yeah, and name, name. Aditya, are you registered? I will register if you take the time. Can we have classes of 515? 515? Why 515? Because I have classes of 415 in LSSC. I understand that, but like, uh, we are already like, I mean, let me ask everybody. But first, ask your question. Can we have classes of 515? No, was there any other question? Any other questions anybody else had? You, so you want to ask another question? Go ahead, Billy. Yeah, so my that question was, so basically, in that original question of, you know, we used the chip and we went on adding computation and yeah. uh, so uh, at a point where we couldn't pull it anymore. Yeah. That is, so, so we are saying that we cannot pull it anymore, assuming that the chip is again getting erased at every point. I mean, 
yeah so the data has to be raised na there, there is no way to do a computation with finite resources without erasure right uh, otherwise otherwise you need a chip that is 10 20 30 times the size right so since we know that erasure is always going to be uh, add, adding heat mm -hmm. so we are uh, considering that and it, because we know that that goes on happening we know that that cannot happen okay 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 so i'll stop the recording then